you here through here everywhere so yeah <laughs> good evening again everyone i'm really we are excited to have you here with us for the third episode of the smart health podcast good evening dr Amers. glad to be here good to be here again yeah and um tonight we we were struggling to find the theme because there's so many good things to talk about it and um and I know there's some hot topics as well. There are topics like diabetes, uh, cancer is one that we'll constantly be talking about it. Um, sure. uh, also, um, some of the exercise, um, I would say uh, habits, I'd say good habits, and we're going to mention some of those tonight. Um, and mental health, we're going to have a guest for the following podcast so you don't want to lose that one for mental health which is a big issue nowadays as well that's right uh and this evening if you've been if you saw the email and if you probably are here right now you understand that we're going to talk about longevity you that's had right. the 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 picture of this old lady who is over 100 years right now and when she was about 86 and we, dr emerson will talk a little bit more about her she started running so, yeah so uh if you're not 86 yet still hope for you <laughs> um but this week i want to start tonight's presentation this week i received a a video a link to a youtube video of a pastor from uh, a baptist church in dallas uh, i did a little research uh he he had a whole sermon on the sabbath like his whole sermon was about rest and at some point in his sermon his sermon he wanted he mentioned uh the seventh day adventist and the relation they have with longevity and rest and and i thought it was really interesting because long a while ago there was a study done known as the blue um how do you call it? blue? The blue zones. The blue zones. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and Seventh Day Adventists are mentioned there in that study, and it's about longevity. Sure. So I actually looked at the video. I I saw. I watched the whole sermon. <laughs> <laughs> it was really amazing what he did uh, to show how important it is to rest. But uh, there's a piece of the video I'd like to play so we can comment on it and start our our show tonight. Okay. So let's see if I can play here and you guys can um, follow. Let me, let me do something here on my computer. Having some feedback. The, okay. What do you mean by the feed? The video feed has not come through. Okay, so, so it's not live. We're not live, technically. Okay, so let, let me play this and see if... We are live. We are? Okay. So let me, uh, let's say here, let me interact with you guys that are there. Whoever, uh, tell us, tell us if everything is okay. Let's see if you get, you guys that are watching, please um, tell us, you can send on the chat, just write anything, just say it's okay, or the sound, or the video, just tell us so we can know what's up. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, so let's start with this short, this piece of the sermon about the Sabbath. Okay, let's see what he has to say and we comment on it. Let's see, let's play here. I have to explain it to you, okay? So just kind of track with me. Now, so sociologists, just track with me. I like nerded out on this. Sociologists, they did this study a few years ago where they were studying the happiest people on earth. And one of the groups of people they found were happiest is a, a little Christian sect called the Seventh Day Adventists. Called the little sect. And you can tell <laughs> in their name, they're like really religious about keeping the Sabbath. Now, not. Okay, point number one at least they know that this is like really religious. It's not like once in a while, it's not like one Sabbath sometimes. So it's like every Sabbath, every seventh day. So. Point number one. Some of the happiest people on earth, they on, a bookmark this in your head. This is going to be real important in about 30 seconds. They on average live 11 years. 11 years. Okay. Uh, another point he's making, I'll fast forward a little bit. 
Uh, he's saying that they live, they live 11 years more than the average American. Well, some studies say a decade, others say seven years, but there's some, uh, uh, depending on where you look, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's a fair variety of different uh, numbers, but it, it is uh, definite that uh, the Seventh-day Adventists do live longer. Mm -hmm. um, and they like looking at Seventh-day Adventists because half of them are vegetarians, half of them are not, and they don't have to control for tobacco or alcohol because they don't smoke, we don't drink alcohol. And so they have a test group, which is the vegetarians, and a control group, which are those that aren't vegetarians, and they find out the benefits of the vegetarian food. And so it's a, it's a nice group to look at. Excellent, excellent. Let's see. Later, so you know I'm not cheating the numbers, okay? Continue the video. Now, let, let me show you this. Let me get the zoom in. So, what we just said, so the average lifespan is it, in is America, it streaming remember, the video? they live 11 years longer okay. than the average American, okay? The average lifespan in America is 77 years, okay? 77 years. Now, but what... By the way, and I checked the 77 years, uh, if you go on Google, it will tell 77.2, but there are other studies that will differ a little bit also, uh, depending on where you look. For the purpose of this is how many days does the average person live? So all we got to do, obviously, is multiply 77 times 365. 65. The average person is going to live uh, 28,105 days. Okay, now, what we want to know, though, is, okay, if a person kept the Sabbath in an average lifetime, how many Sabbaths would they observe? So this obviously, a Sabbath, the command is once every seven days to take a day of rest, holy unto the Lord. So what we need to do to figure uh, how many Sabbaths would the person observe, obviously we just got to divide the number of days by seven to get number of Sabbaths they'd observe. So if you do that, the average person in an average 4, lifespan would observe 4,015 Sabbath days over a 77-year lifetime. Now... Okay, this is cool, what does fine, that's now. a great little fact, Josh. Now, I'm just curious, I'm just curious, if you set it in terms of years instead of days, how many years worth of just Sabbaths would a person uh, enjoy during their lifetime? Well, obviously, 365 days in a year, so we just need to divide that number by 365, and we'll know exactly how many years worth of Sabbaths they observed, and guess what it is? Exactly 11. Yeah, and then he, he's a funny pastor, so he, he's saying, wow, the math people now are blown away. He say, what? <laughs> but uh, he plays with the numbers, and, he, and, and he, keeps, he goes on with his sermon to talk about four reasons to keep the Sabbath, which I thought it was really interesting. But the interesting thing, I'm going to put the computer right here, uh, is that he, there's a correlation there with uh, rest, keeping the Sabbath, and longevity. And not only that, I, I guess, I mean, the studies also show it's not just to live more, it's to live healthier, right? That's right, yeah. Uh, people sometimes fear getting old that they're going to have an awful existence. And the last years might be in a nursing home. And so you, you really want extra years that are vibrant and full exactly. years. Yeah. Um, now, Adventists do live a lot longer than the normal population. Uh, this can be a problem. I ran into a problem when uh, I was covering for my partners in the, uh, on the weekend, and I was seeing an elderly patient. He was in his 80s, and he was in the intensive care unit. And uh, he, was, he was an Adventist and a Christian. And, uh, but sometimes in the intensive care unit, they get confused. He starts asking for his mother. He's wondering, oh, how is she? What's she doing? And I, and I said, oh, sir, she's okay. She's, you know, she's waiting for Jesus to come. And uh, uh, he says, oh, she died, and they didn't tell me. He says, oh, sir, it's okay. She's, she's resting. she could get to see her in heaven. And so I calmed him down. But then on Monday, when his regular physician came back in, uh, he said, well, how, how are the patients doing? I said, oh, they're okay, except the guy in the intensive care unit. He's a little confused, asking for his mother. And I told him, oh, because he was in his 80s. And I, I said, oh, you know, she's, she's okay. She's waiting for Jesus to come. Or she's resting in the grave, waiting for Jesus to come. And he said, no. She's 102. She's in the nursing home. <laughs> I go, oh, no. So I had to go up and reassure him that she was okay. Wow. Um, but, uh, yes, they do have uh, uh, blue zones, and the Seventh-day Adventists in Southern California, that is a blue zone. 
they uh, were interviewing a lot of centenarians, and uh, uh, one of them I remember was an elderly lady, and they s they interview her saying, "Well, you don't look 100, you don't look 90. Why, you don't look even 80. Why, you don't even look 70." And she smiled. She said, "Keep talking." <laughs> so, <laughs> oh but, no, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, they they, they do live longer and uh, and more vibrant. Um, now I you mentioned amazing Mavis. Okay. Yes. Um, let's. Yeah. Let's she, uh, as a as a child, she uh, uh, had some bronchitis, affected her lungs. By about age sixty, she was twenty pounds overweight from years of inactivity. Then she heard a, a lecture by a, a health evangelist, and uh, she started walking, and she started walking daily, and then she started jogging, and then she started jogging more and more until she was jogging like six days a week. She would take the seventh day off. And uh, her son, uh, who was a medical doctor, when she was in her, uh, must have been in her 60s, maybe 70s, uh, signed her up for the Avenue of the Giants Marathon. And I'm thinking, boy, I bet all you uh, parents out there wish you had a son that would do that for you, right? <laughs> but she entered it, and she set a... Uh, world record in her age group wow. for it. Um, but she is a vegetarian, um, and she had a VO2 max, which is, VO2 max is the amount of, it's, it's the best measure of cardiovascular fitness that we have. It measures the amount of oxygen you burn per minute. And that typically declines as we get older, but uh, hers was equivalent to someone in their 20s. Wow, um, she had she had actually increased it uh, just through that exercise. She was a vegetarian to optimize strength and endurance, and uh, uh, she is uh, written up in uh, Sports Illustrated. They call her Amazing Mavis. Yeah, and for those skepticals out there, she's not the only one. There, there are more like her. And and I not long ago I just seen on Instagram a guy that was also getting close to 100, he also ran. And when the interviewer, like the reporter, they were doing a podcast actually, he was asking him, you know, what are the secrets? And he was saying a few things, which we believe, which he's always grateful. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a vegetarian as well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, did exercise, obviously he was a runner. So there's a lot of uh, um, uh, common things that relates to longevity. So it's not just because of good genes. You, yeah. you even mentioned that she had problems when she was younger. That's right. Yeah, yeah I, I heard an evangelist say, you know, you, you've got to have a purpose in life because that'll give God an excuse to keep you around a little longer. So. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> definitely. Now, some people might be asking, okay, well, then tell us what are some things we can do to uh, live longer and, and healthier? They actually did a study, and this was recorded, and I think proof positive, but it was done in 1972 uh, by Breslow, and it was in the county of Alameda, where actually I grew up, <coughs> and they, they did surveys, and they were looking for things that correlated most closely with longevity. So they did the surveys, and then they followed people to find out how long they lived, and they put them in different groups, and they found seven habits that correlated very strongly with longevity. And some of them were, were pretty surprising. Um, and they, they calculated how much longer you would live if you kept all seven or if you didn't keep any. And for instance, a 60-year-old, if he didn't keep any of these health habits compared to a, 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 a normal, the average 60-year-old, he would die 24 years sooner if he kept none of them, zero to two of those. But if he kept all seven of those, he would live actually 16 years longer than the average 60-year-old. Mm. Um, and so these seven health habits actually were verified through, through the study. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is one of the things was sleeping seven to eight hours a night. Mm. It was one of the seven. Um, they estimate that we sleep about one and a half hours less than our ancestors did because our ancestors, when the sun went down, they went to sleep. But we have so many fun things to do that keeps us up. Um, and another thing about sleep is sleep will actually increase your productivity. Uh, they did a study with the military, uh, and they looked at uh, artillery groups. And what they did is they, they counted the number of simulated shells 
were hit on target in a day. And for the group that got seven hours of sleep, first night they got 300, first day they got 360 shells on target. But then another group got six hours, another group got five, and another group got four hours of sleep. Now the group that got four hours of sleep, because they had three extra hours to shoot on day one, it wasn't 360, they got 400 shells. They got more shells because they had more time. But that was day one. When they took them out about three or, s three or four weeks, they then found that the group getting seven hours of sleep was still getting 360 shells on target. But those getting four hours of sleep, they were getting 60 shells on oh, target. Wow. They had dropped to 17% of what they could have been doing because if they'd been getting seven hours of sleep. And this, the frightening thing about it was when they asked the group that was getting four hours of sleep, how well they're doing? How are you guys doing in terms of, you know, on, sh on target shells? They thought they were doing great. Oh. They had no perception that their performance had declined so dramatically. Oh. And, you know, I wonder how many of us, you know, getting our chronic sleep deprivation, we have trouble functioning at work, and we think there's something genetic wrong with us, or, wow. you know, something you know, physiologic wrong with us, when it's, it could simply be lack of sleep. That one and a half hours less sleep in that artillery study cut their productivity by 50%. Oh, that's amazing. And I understand there there has been some studies on daylight savings. Whenever they, oh. you know, you lose an hour, suppose the people end up having to wake up a little earlier than, than they're used to. The, the number of car accidents increase during this time. That's very true. Yes, the day after you lose an hour, motor vehicle accidents went up. The day after they gained an hour, they went down. Actually, the two biggest um, causes of motor vehicle accidents is uh, alcohol and mm. lack of sleep. Wow. Those are the, the two big ones. And they, they both tend to affect the nervous system in a similar, in a similar fashion. Fascinating. So I, you know, there's one habit. It, a lot of people find it so common and uh, see no problem in it. And I've learned a while back that that's terrible. And then if you do that, even we had a little... Uh, test to find out your biological age. I remember when we do mm -hmm. like health fairs, we would, you know, come to some questions and, and then based upon the questions you fill in in the computer and they will give you the biological age based upon your answers. And one of the things mentioned is eating between meals. Yes. And uh, people don't realize how terrible that can be. But uh, physiologically, I mean, you, you would assume if you have two cars, one runs the engine all the time, and the other runs and rest and runs and rest. Which one will last longer? I mean, that's it's not a brainer, right? Yeah. Tell us a little yeah. bit more about yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, and there there is a um, a challenge in digestion. Um, when you eat foods, your salivary glands um, excrete their digestive juices into the food. You have pancreatic juices, which go into the stomach to digest the food. Those glands empty themselves when you have a meal. Those glands, after the meal, start filling up again, getting ready for the next meal. And it takes about four to five hours for those glands to fill up again. So if you're eating between meals, you're not going to get enough digestive juices to digest the food wow. properly. And so you're going to have food that's not digested trying to get into your bloodstream and if you've got undigested amino acids or proteins that get into the into the bloodstream you can get allergies and 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 other difficulties um we have a oh it's an epidemic of allergies um, oh, people true. are having so many allergies now um, and food allergies are, are 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 very common now and uh this simple practice of not eating between meals can go a long way to helping in that regard. Yeah, it could avoid a lot of that allergy. But I understand also talking about aller allergy, uh, dairy product, like there's casein, right? It produ like produces, it helps produce a lot of... Uh, Allergies, yes. Um, actually, <laughs> milk is designed to give you allergies, if well, I okay. might say that, uh, in the sense that when a baby cow is born, it does not have the immunoglobulins it needs to fight infections. It gets those from the 
mother's milk, from the cow's milk. Those are proteins, and when they go into the, the cow, normally that protein, which is a chain of amino acids, would get cut up into amino acids and get absorbed into the bloodstream. But if that happened, those immunoglobulins wouldn't have their protective effect. So God has designed those to be absorbed directly without being digested. So those immunoglobulins are absorbed into the cow's calf's bloodstream, and they fight infections. Mm. The problem is when a human drinks that cow's milk, those immunoglobulins are also absorbed and go directly into the bloodstream. And unfortunately, in a human, the human's bloodstream recognizes it as a foreign, foreign. protein mm. and says, this is a foreign invader. We have to attack it. And it, it creates an immune response, an allergic response. And that's why cow's milk is, is known as one of the most allergenic foods we know there of. There is, yeah. And, and it's be because of that, that design in them. So, you know, cow's milk is the perfect food for baby cows. Right. But but not for not for amazing not for people. I know. Now, another point that uh, people may excuse themselves. So I've been I've been there. Is when we have s busy schedules, we're running to and fro, and we're so you know, uh, especially for business owners or depending on what your job is, you just don't have regularity in your eating habits. And what does that do to us? Well, um, as Breslow found, he found, okay, sleep was number one. The number two was eating between meals, lowered longevity. And the third one was, again, eating breakfast regularly, prolonged life. Um, we find that uh, several things about breakfast. The calories burn, or taken in in the morning tend to get burned. The ones taken in at night tend to get stored. Mm. Uh, they did do an interesting study when they looked at the body mass index, which is an index of how heavy we are, and they found that the group that had their main meal in the evening had the highest body mass index. Those that had their main meal at lunch had a little bit lower body mass index, and the people that had the main meal for breakfast had the lowest body mass index. Mm. And generally speaking in America, the largest meal is typically the evening meal, Right. And if we're going to skip a meal, the meal we skip is generally breakfast. Hmm. It's, and in terms of weight control, it's, uh, that habit is going to produce increase in weight. Um, I knew Dr. Agatha Thrash when she was living, and she, when she was asked, how do you lose weight? She said something similar. She said, skip suppers. And, hmm. and that's one way. If you're anxious to lose weight quickly, that's one way to do it. You're not trying to decrease the total daily calories but you shift when you eat those calories to breakfast and lunch. Wow, that was a great tip. I guess a lot of uh, the women there are happy now. <laughs> now, the, th the thing is, is the difficult is to do it. We talked about compliance, you know, mm -hmm. last podcast. And uh, that, that is one reason why we're developing this coaching and, and, and this, th it's, it's an extra help to help people actually hit their goals because we understand it's it's hard sometimes you know you just you have that craving and you, you just can't you know my dad or he would say uh no you know i i, I get if i if i stop eating I, he eats all the time <laughs> oh <laughs> he's gotten better after he was had some you know problems with cancer but but back then he would say no i can't i will i will just uh drop that <laughs> he would say i i have to eat all the time um, yeah, I'm hungry all the time, but I, I think it's a, it's, it, you're mistaken. You, you, you had that feeling you think it's hunger, but you know, it's, it's, you're, how can you be hungry if you're eating all the time? Like just beats of, <laughs> so yeah. And anyway, I, I find it, um, uh, uh, friends also, they say, I can't go to bed hungry. I just, I just stay there lying bad and I don't fall asleep, <laughs> but I, I guess it's just habits, right? Yeah, actually, when if you have regular meal times, your body starts to adapt to it, and you start getting hungry before the regular meal time. And if you if you if you stick to that meal time, the hunger pattern will start to follow yeah. when you regularly eat. 
Yeah, and I've been, I've lived in different countries, uh, Brazil and, and Colombia, and I s the commonest, I mean, a really common thing I would see it's people eating very light breakfast in the morning, like a like a white bread with coffee, mm. and that's it. Or in Colombia, it would be like you know their buñuelo, which is like a fry um, a dough with mm -hmm. a little bit of cheese. That's it. Nothing nutritious and coffee, and that's it for the morning and I'll say wow that that can't keep you alive I mean and yeah yeah it, it, it can be a problem um, what happens is the the white breads and sugar and coffee or whatever and even coffee itself will cause a sugar spike and with that you get an insulin spike and insulin is designed to bring blood sugars back down it's it it's like a key which opens the doors of the cells and allows sugar to enter the cells and get burned so when you take a high glycemic index meal, which is a meal that is absorbed very quickly and causes a very rapid rise in blood sugar, the pancreas releases an oversupply of insulin. It panics. It releases a lot of insulin, and you have a drop in blood sugar, and it goes too low. And generally, in about an hour and a half or so, or two hours after the, that high glycemic index meal, your blood sugar will crash, it'll go too low, and you'll crave more sugar. Mm. So you get another sugar fee. And I, I, when I was in college, I did this. I, I, every two hours, I'd be needing to go to the candy machine and get another candy bar to get another sugar fix. And, and that is the reason. And throughout the day, that was happening. Well, when I started understanding and changing the types of food I was eating, I found that, and this is pretty well understood, that a low glycemic index meal mm. will last four or five hours. It will release sugar into your bloodstream Slowly. over four or five hours. And you say, well, what's a, what's a low glycemic index meal? Uh, beans, legumes, that's the beans, peas, lentils, chickpeas, even peanuts. They're a legume family. When you eat those, they release their sugar over four or five hours. And if you eat beans for breakfast, you won't get hungry till one or two in the afternoon. Um, it's, it's, people say, I, uh, really? And, and it's hard to believe until you actually try it. Um, and it's strange for Americans when they say beans for breakfast, you know, that's kind of a strange thing. But many, f most third world countries, mm. they'll have legumes for breakfast. Mm. And it does very well. Even um, if you're used to eggs, if you swap to scrambled tofu, which is a bean, um, it's a very good option. To if, you, if you're making a, a, a shift or a change to a plant-based diet. Most countries in the world, third world countries, do this program where they will choose a grain and a legume. That's a bean pea, lentil, chickpea, peanut. They'll choose a grain and legume that grows locally as their staple. So Mexico, it's corn and beans. China, it's rice and peas. Mexi in uh, India, it's a wheat tortilla and lentils. And in Ethiopia, it's teff, which is a grain, and chickpeas, another legume. And then they fill it out with fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Very interesting. Yeah. Another factor, I understand, is to maintain proper weight, which for some people might be really difficult. We already touched a little bit on that by just by skipping the last meal and having being regular on breakfast. What else can we do to maintain proper weight? Yeah, you want to avoid a low-calorie diet. Um, what they found is when you on a low-calorie diet, your body compensates by turning down your metabolism. You slow the rate at which you burn calories. It's done through your thyroid gland. Your thyroid starts releasing less thyroxin. Your metabolism slows down. Then when you come off the diet, your body says, we've just been through you know, semi-starvation. We now have calories. We better get ready for the next starvation. Mm -hmm. And the body's designed to protect you from starvation. So it says, okay, we've got calories now. Get ready for the next starvation. We're going to increase the muscle mass a little bit from what we've lost, but it won't, we won't bring it up to what we were prior to the starvation diet. And then we're going to shift those calories to fat. And mm -hmm. so we're going to have more fat to feed less muscle in the next starvation. Mm -hmm. World War II, they had co conscientious objectors, 32 of them. They had to study starvation because they're going to free starvation victims in concentration camps. Six months of starvation, muscle mass dropped like 60% of normal. Body fat dropped to 30% of normal. When they came off the fast, over the next year, the muscle mass rose, but it was still at the end of the year below what it used to be. But body fat 
at 33 weeks was 10 pounds above what it was before they started. Mm. And at a year, it was still three pounds above what it was before it started. And that was to get ready for the next starvation. Wow. In countries where they have annual starvations, they'll starve and then they'll eat. They'll starve. When the crops run out, they starve and they become skin and bones. And when they eat, they become obese. And so one of the most challenging things is to try to get people to steer away from a low-calorie diet and instead shift to a, a plant-based diet without free oils, and that lowers insulin resistance. And when you lower insulin resistance, the, the amount of insulin the body has to produce decreases. And when you have decreased insulin, body fat starts coming off without even... I mean, exercise is good, but even without exercise, the weight starts wow. coming off without mm -hmm. calorie restriction or, or even exercise. Amazing. Yeah, if people could only do those simple things, they would see a huge difference in their life. Amen. Yes. Yeah, I hope with all the, the effort that we're putting on this podcast, all this information, I really hope that you are benefiting from this, really. I, that's the reason why we're here. Also, obviously... Um, we're here based, uh, um, sponsored by the Emerson's Clinic and the um, Heartland Wellness Center, which, which is uh, where we work. And uh, yeah. this is what we do. And we there are ways that we can further help people when they need special help. And uh, the podcast helps um, people to find out about these other options to seek help. And we're here for, for you. So going on, with um, with the list, uh, you mentioned exercise that people can lose weight even without exercise. But what if they do exercise? They found um, actually initially studies with rats that as rats, the group that exercised not at all weight was up here. Twenty minutes it dropped. Forty minutes a day, the group that forty minutes a day it dropped again. At sixty minutes it dropped again. But after sixty minutes, at one hour, two hours, three hours. Beyond one hour, there was a plateau. No further weight loss was attained. Um, and, uh, and so they found also that uh, calorie intake actually decreased as you went from zero to one hour. And that was because the main calorie use is to keep your body warm. 75% of your calories just keep your body warm. Only 25% is what we use for talking, thinking, running, bicycling, whatever. Wow. Um, and so as the body weight decreased, the amount of heat they lost decreased as well because heat was loss was related to body surface area. And as the body surface area shrunk, they needed less calories because they were losing less in heat. But as soon as the weight stabilized at one hour, more exercise, there was no further weight loss and now calorie intake increased in direct proportion to how much they exercised because the body surface area wasn't changing. I said, well, those are rats. They actually found the same thing in India. They went to a, a group in India, and they found that um, <coughs> they rated each worker at the mill that they were studying as according to their activity level. They had five different activity levels, and they found the same thing. As activity increased, um, going from a clerk to a, a, a winder or a bagger, the weight dropped. And then at a certain point, further activity level, the blacksmiths and the coalmen, there was no further weight loss. It, it plateaued. Um, and so exercise is helpful to a point, but beyond that point, there's no further weight loss. And they said, well, what kind of, you know, what kind of activity you know, should I be doing? Right. You know, should That's I be running? Question. Should I be bicycling, walking? And they, they actually found that uh, in a group of like 32 people, they had them choose different exercises. And those that chose running or bicycling uh, or swimming were either not able to do it long enough, 30 minutes, to be included in the study, or they got injured, injuries from running, and only the people that were walking were able to, to do it consistently for 30 minutes a day. And that doesn't mm. mean you can't do other exercises, but if you want the best chance of success, mm. that's, that's the place to start. And they found that as they, as, as they exercised from, say, 60 minutes going up to 90 minutes, the body 
weight plateaued, dropped again. But nobody went from 90 to two hours, so I really don't know if that extra time would, would, would be of benefit. Um, but the, uh, um, the, the benefit also, if they got sick and stopped, weight jumped up. Mm. And then as soon as they started exercising, it dropped back in. So if you're using exercise alone for weight loss, you're going to have to keep doing it if you want to maintain the weight, lo <laughs> the weight loss. But on the other hand, if you use combined with the other good habits, yes. it would be really beneficial. You have to get, yeah. Um, there is an interesting uh, so you know is 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 uh, is exercise the ultimate answer and uh, John McDougall uh, uh, he's written many books uh, he's an internist uh, promoting a healthy plant-based lifestyle he was on a, a talk show he relates this in one of his books with uh, Carl Lewis the world's fastest man on earth uh, at the time he mm -hmm. set the world records for the 100-yard dash and prior to getting on stage Carl Lewis confided that, you know, I have trouble maintaining my weight. And McDougal kind of says, well, you, you nobody exercises more than you do. <laughs> and he <laughs> says, well, yeah, if I eat too much, I gain weight. And then McDougal explains, says, anybody on the American lifestyle will have a problem with weight. Wow. No matter how much they exercise. If you go on a plant-based diet without the free oils, you'll be able to eat as much as you want and maintain your weight will stay down. Fantastic. And a year later, Sports Magazine interviewed him, and he said, yeah, a year ago, I went on a plant-based diet, and I had the best year performance ever, or two, I can eat as much as I want, and I don't, don't gain weight. And that's because the plant-based diet without the oils is, is major in terms of getting rid of insulin resistance, allowing insulin levels to drop, and the weight coming down in, in association with that. Um, we have a whole uh, talk on just weight control, and the things that have been shown to work and the things that have been shown not mm. to work. Well, pretty good. Uh, well, the last two points, uh, obviously, I mean, they are obvious, but uh, a lot of people still do them, which is uh, alcohol and smoking. Yeah. And you, before we actually started the podcast, you mentioned a list of the, the causes of death in the United mm -hmm. States, and they're pretty intense and and you even mentioned about uh, old age um, yeah I loved what you shared about old age it's not even the, the on the list the right list of 10. They, uh, yes in 1990 they did a, a study as the causes of death mm -hmm. and number nine was illicit drugs number eight motor vehicle accidents then sexual behavior firearms toxic agents microbial agents that's infections but then at the top of the list, then uh, number three was alcohol, number two was tobacco, but that's what number one was, that was diet and exercise wow. uh, as the main cause of death in the United States in, uh, in 1990. And the interesting thing about, about alcohol is, you know, when we think of a, an alcoholic, you know, they, they drink a, a shot of whiskey, you know, one and a half ounces of 40% um, alcohol is actually 0.6 ounces of alcohol. And someone might say, well, I don't drink the hard stuff, I just drink wine. Well, wine is about 12% alcohol, but a five ounce glass, 5% of 12 ounces is point, uh, or point is, is point 0.6 ounces of alcohol. It's the same as a shot of whiskey. Hmm. And they say, well, I don't drink the wine, I just drink beer. but Beer is 5% alcohol, and a 12-ounce can is, again, 0.6 ounces of pure alcohol. So all the so same. It's all, yeah, it's all the same. Beer is just a little more diluted than, than, the, than the, the shot of whiskey. Well, so. yeah, and not only that, it's not to say that the, the accidents they cause um, and, um, and the violence also they, what they call, that they cause and the health problems. We had an so. intake form, we had a private practice, and, and when it got to alcohol, if they had a significant amount of alcohol, when it got down to marital status, it was almost always divorced. Mm. Uh, alcohol and marriage is, just, just don't mix. Wow. They just don't mix. So. Yeah, smoking. Smoking, it's hard to believe that still today, I know back then in the 80s, I mean, not 80s, in the 1800s, <laughs> the mm. late 1800s, early 1900s, people thought, smoking was good 
Yeah, I remember looking at some of the old advertisements, the doctor mm -hmm. saying, recommended by the doctors. Ah. <laughs> you know, doctors recommend. And, and still today, they're having a hard time trying to sh tell people, hey, all the causes of, of diseases and illnesses and, and death and, you know, by, and cancer, but still... Um, yeah, it, you, you wonder how, you know, how to motivate people. And there was actually a doctor trying to motivate a group of women to stop smoking. And, and he talked about, you know, lung cancer and emphysema and heart attacks and strokes and different cancers, even bladder cancers. But they kind of chatting in the background. You couldn't really get their attention until he said something that struck their hearts with fear. There was dead silence. You could hear a pin drop. He had just told them smoking caused wrinkles. So now they're concerned, <laughs> but oh, it actually does. It breaks down collagen, which gives you your firmness in your skin, and it, mm. it does actually contribute to, to wrinkles. In the old days, um, there was controversy in the 80s and 90s about smoking, and uh, there was actually a video produced back then called Death in the West. It was about the most famous ad campaign in the history of advertising, the Marlboro Man, mm. and it... it it, it then interviewed um, the people that were producing the cigarettes, and then it interviewed, uh, by the way, the Marlboro Man actually developed cancer. They had to remove part of his jaw, and he went around to different high schools trying to undo what he had done with the, the videos. But they interviewed uh, five or six real-life cowboys in this movie that were dying of, can of, of a smoking-related illness. Mm. And the saddest one is at the end where a, uh, oh, a, uh, a, a woman was just sad saying, yeah, my, my husband's getting thinner and thinner every day and he's just wasting away and the doctors don't give him much time and you think, wow, what's going on with him? And then he says, oh, here he comes now. And he's a guy coming up on a horse, getting closer. He said, wow, here's, here's the life out on the range with the horse. And he gets closer, he sees something sticking, coming out of his nose. He thought, what's that in his nose? And when the horse turns around, the... Uh, the uh, rifle holster has a canister of oxygen in it, and he's dying of emphysema. Wow. And in the, in the credits at the end of the movie, um, they basically said as soon as the movie came out, one month later, he, he died. Wow, and that's uh, so that sad. That's very sad. Yeah. But people know today that smoking is dangerous, is harmful to the health. And so the uh, Seventh day Adventist five day stop smoking plans have shifted their target. Used to be we were just trying to convince people that it's, it's harmful. Now people know. Now they network with other people trying to stop smoking. So they do it as a group and they can, they can do it online together mm. as a group. So they have some social support when they're going through the change. Awesome. I hope to put some information on the description for those who will watch later if they want some information on that. Uh, and and here's, here's the thing. That's why... We're here. That's why we have the Wellness Center, the Emerson, Emerson's Clinic, and because we understand that sometimes people by themselves, they lack the willpower to do what they, in most cases, even know what they should do, but uh, they need help. We, we need help. We need each other. And um, I'd like to say some things regarding that uh, before you talk about that, that, that group um, that lived 120 years. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, I, I know that, um, I, the first podcast I mentioned about my mom and then one of the friends, one of my friends that watched the podcast, they said, well, you mentioned about your mom, but you actually didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So many things going on. And it was the first podcast putting mm -hmm. things together. And I think, I mean, we're getting better and I know the more we do it, the more we'll get the hang of it and the more, um, the better will become and more benefit you'll be. Uh, regarding my mom, she, she had a, you know, a, a list of bad habits that she was doing. It. Uh, she was a, a businesswoman at that point for several years. She didn't have time for anything. Uh, mm. She would eat at any time. She would just, uh, her stress level was really high. Um, she managed at that point around 30 people in her business and uh, she forgot to drink water she barely drank water but i would say that also 
Oh, oh, at that point, she actually was drinking coffee. She didn't sleep a lot. Um, I could go in the list. I mean, the list will go, could go on and on. But she did have uh, some psychological problems. Uh, some, she was dealing with some emotionals, emotion uh, that I didn't know back then. Only later, uh, when she was really, really sick, that she opened up and, and said that previous years she had gone to conferences um, to try to... She, she was a strong woman outside. Everybody thought she was very strong, that she could do anything, that she was a leader at the church. She was a leader at her uh, business. But inside, she had some unresolved things. And one of the things was kind of... Um, uh, this victim spirit, she didn't have a father, a mother, she didn't know who they were. Uh, then later on in life, she met her dad, but no relation at all. Uh, and we mentioned about the last podcast, that studies done when you don't have a good relationship with your father or mother. So that was one thing. I mean, and she had a also a forgiveness issue she had mm. some grudge she was not able to forgive i guess she, she, because later on she said well finally you know i forgave but that was already too late i guess on her health stage but the thing i learned not to make a story short is that yeah once she found out that she had cancer she uh, she did a lot of things she she seek help. She sought for help. Uh, she went to wellness centers, many of them, mm -hmm. and she tried to do many different things, which is understandable. You want to live. She had uh, grandchildren at this point, so she really wanted mm -hmm. to live. Uh, but she didn't stick with one thing, and she was. Uh, she would go to a place, learn about it, go home, continue with her life, and then go to another place, uh, learn other things, and then. She didn't really stick with one thing. I'm not going to say that that was the main cause, but now that I'm involved in works like this and looking at other people's experiences, I understand how helpful it is to stick with the program uh, and not only the health, uh, the physical health. It's try to change your habits, your physical habits, but also um, compliance, like stick with it. The mental, also try to see if there's anything that's blocking your way uh, anything that may be preventing you from being grateful to life. And, and then the third is spiritual. And, uh, and I'm really glad to be a part of this um, ministry in the wellness center because we try to work those three areas. And, um, and another reason we're doing these videos is because we want to create more awareness so people can learn that there is help. They can find about uh, us. They can, it's their hope. We have successful stories. You, you, mm -hmm. you know a lot of them. I've looked through the, 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 the book where we have registered over this last 30 years of ministry. Mm -hmm. You have quite long history as well, working and helping people. So don't, uh, don't wait uh, until the last minute. And for every video we do, we try to do small versions too. So if you, if you are not on our mailing list, Try to um, just uh, send us a message. Put put your information there on the chat. Write to us, and we'll contact you. We'll put you on the, on our list. We'll send you uh, materials. We'll, we'll send you uh, new videos when we make them. So yeah, get get on board. Help your friends as well. Maybe you're not sick, but maybe your friends is. you maybe you don't you want to help your neighbors, and you don't know how. Tell them about the videos. Share it to them. Um, uh, tell them about uh, the wellness center and, and so they can be connected with us and learn more about how they can be helped. So now let's, you mentioned about the story about the time of Alex, Alexander the Great. Yes, Alexander the Great had conquered the world, but four of his soldiers wanted to go AWOL, away without leaving. They wanted to escape. But when your general's conquer the whole world, where do you go? Well, they went up to the Himalayas. They took their wives up there and they started a colony up there called the Hunzas. And they are in a, this mountain setting. It's uh, actually Shangri-La or uh, Lost Horizons or is, a, is sort of a, a, a fictional story based on the Hunzas that live up there. And, and, uh, but up in this kind of 
Edenic-like area, uh, the climate's mild, they have fertile land, and they live to be about 120 or so. Wow. And uh, they are strong and healthy their whole lives, and they, uh, the way they die is they, um, they just get up one morning, they go out and work in the fields, they come home, they go to sleep, they don't wake up. It's like Not around a good 120. Way to die. Wow. Um, now, now this is you know let you know how unusual this is. I I, I I was in Ardmore, Oklahoma. We had a patient come in and and she's an elderly woman. And, and I said, oh, what can we help you with? She says, well, I need a history and physical. I said, okay, well, what are your wh what are your problems? She says, well, I, I don't have any. I said, well, why are you here? <laughs> and I <laughs> said, well, she said, well, I'm going to a retirement village and they require me to have a doctor and a history and physical done. So I did it and and that was fine. Well, several years later. Um, I get, I, I find out that she's passed away at the, at the home, and, and uh, they give me the death certificate. So I'm supposed to fill out the death certificate, cause of death. I said, well, I don't know what she died of. And so I, I call up the, you know, I wasn't there, and I call up the medical examiner. I said, uh, how do I fill out this medical, this, uh, this uh, death certificate? And he s I said, you know, I wasn't there when she died. And he says, oh, well, just put one of her chronic diseases down. And I said, well, she didn't have any. He goes, she didn't have any? And I said, well, can I put old age? He says, Old age? I've not seen that before. Let me ask my supervisor. <laughs> and he comes back and says, yeah, yeah, you, you can put old age. But they've never seen that. It yeah, doesn't amazing. happen anymore. Yeah. But, uh, but in, in Hunza land, they actually can die of old age when they're about 120. They, uh, the glacial water is kind of a grayish water. And the glaciers scrape up all the minerals as they go. And the minerals are then deposited on the land. And the trees, they grow a lot of fruit trees. They're basically a plant-based society, um, ha are full of the nutrients that they need. And when the people eat those nutrients, um, they get all the nutrients and the trace elements that they need. Uh, Max Gerson emphasized this as well. He said he had about 51 trace elements that he said need to be in the soil so that the plants can absorb them so that you can get them when you eat the plants eat the plants. Mm. Well, anyway, so they've got a rich soil. Uh, they work. It's a very agrarian type society. The only animal products they have is uh, some milk, some goats, because the land is not plentiful enough to support animals. Right. And so they're basically vegetarian society. Um, they're very peaceful society. Uh, the only court they have, the mayor has court once a week. And the only, they don't have any crime, the only issue there is water rights. Who gets the water when? <laughs> and uh, um, if a house blows down or gets destroyed, the neighbors come and they contribute and they all help build them a new house. And so it's uh, a very peaceful setting. And uh, they, like I said, they, they live to be about 120. They've had a couple um, books written about them, about their longevity. Yeah, wow. Wonderful group. So. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I'm sure many of us would love to get to that point and not to live longer, but to live healthier. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and I just want to recap that, you know, the, the seven things that have been shown statistically is, again, seven to eight hours of sleep a night, not eating between meals, eat breakfast regularly, maintain a proper weight with a basically a plant-based, no oil diet, uh, get regular exercise, uh, avoid use of alcohol, and no smoking. And they have been shown to actually add years to your life. Awesome. Well, I think it was a very profitable podcast. Um, surely, many of you would like to live longer. And I, I actually talked to my daughter yeah, yesterday, and then... She said, well, I don't want to live longer. I said, no, it's not just to live longer. <laughs> it's to live longer, he healthier, and, um, you know, enjoy more. I said, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I liked that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you have this idea that once you get old, you, you have to have a disease. It's not true. And um, we had some examples today, tonight, and uh, you can be one of them. And it's not too late. You can always start. It's never too late. And we also have a health program for those that want to learn and be trained uh, and help other people and also prevention. Unfortunately, many people come when they're really sick 
But ideal would be to come when you're not really sick, when you want to learn and, and prevent. And, you know, and that way you don't have to um, be sorry later on or feel the consequences of not taking care of your health now. So uh, I'd like to thank you for watching. Um, I hope to see you next time. And I'll promise that I'll get better on the email. I was using a new platform uh, this week, so uh, bear with me. And, but I know many people will receive this email later on, and this is gonna, going to be recorded on YouTube. You can watch it later. Many will be watching later, definitely. And then uh, I'll, do the, I'll send you the short videos later on. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emerson. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yes, and stay tuned for other amazing subjects.